All right, Joe. Well, welcome. Thank you for coming out today for the Wallace and Saul Colloquium. Today we have two of our professors in the uh, department, uh, Dr. Colbert Cumberling and Dr. Peter Crowder, um, who came to the limits of our industry. And they're going to talk about uh, bringing the bottom uh, market. Um, they have a lot of stories that they could get lost on. I don't know if they ever did any work in history, but you know, uh, we'll, we'll find out. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Joe. Can can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. But on, okay. Yeah, Dr. Crowder and I, uh, we went to graduate school together a little over 100 years ago, and uh, so we worked in different things since then. We worked together at Amico Laser Company, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and Dr. Crowder will talk more. But uh, in preparing for this, I didn't know Dr. Crowder was going to have a fishing picture up there. So uh, I just want you to know that I can fish too. And uh, this was, he and I were out in, uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> we were out in Wyoming uh, earlier this year, so that's from there. But anyway, about a year and a half ago, I turned on a computer on Yahoo. They had this video. And let me see if it will run here. I haven't tried it here. Well, it looks like it's not going to run. Oh, well. Anyway, if you type in doggy fountain, what it is, you can see this plate here. The dog presses on the plate. It's hooked to a garden hose, shoots water up, and the dog gets a drink. Okay. And so it has several videos online about this here where they do that. Okay. Well, anyway, I designed that, and I, that's why I was kind of surprised to see that online on Yahoo. I designed that thing because I was working at a company at the time called API, Allied Precision Industries, and they made uh, products for, for pet and egg type applications. And we had had a guy come to us, a guy named Tony Lytle, and he had this idea, but he had this crude thing, so it came to me, I was director of operations, and I designed it to where we could market it. So uh, it was kind of fun because while I was there, I designed several products. And uh, a few of them here were different things. I can go over to Menards or Farm and Fleet now, walk in there, and walk down the aisles, and after a few minutes, I can probably find something on the shelf that I actually designed or hold a patent on or something like that. So this is uh, a neat thing. You can be creative. You can uh, do different things with it. In fact, two of these products, a water wiggler and a pond breather, were on this, ask this old house on TV where they had it. So it's kind of neat to be able to sit there and see something on TV and go, ah, eh, that was my idea or something like that. Okay. But bringing a product to market, there's a lot of different things that go into it. <clears throat> so you're sitting there and maybe you, uh, you know, hey, you got a great idea or something. And maybe it's an original idea or maybe it's just an improvement over something that's already out there. So for one in, uh, uh, but there may be a lot of things you have to overcome to bring to market. I'll talk real quick about this. This is something we made called a water wiggler. Okay. This wasn't my idea, but I was uh, involved with designing it. What it does, this is a uh, you know a gardening or whatever type product or pet type product. What it does is it has a little spinner down there. You set it into a bird bath, and it stirs the water. That's all it does. But what that does is the birds can now see the water and attracts birds. And also by stirring the water, it keeps mosquitoes from landing to lay eggs. And this was at a time that you had West Nile virus and stuff, this thing. So they had this idea for this, and this is about the time I start working for the company. <clears throat> but they want to run off a battery. And because you don't want to run an electrical cord out to your bird bath. So they run 
want to run off a battery, but stirring water takes a lot of energy. So the idea was, well, we're just going to stir the surface so we'll have something that floats. Okay. But as the thing's spinning, the has spin so fast, the friction, the float, would not rise or go down with the water. Okay. So I came in and said, first off, I took out the, uh, they had a very thick uh, plastic piece for the uh, uh, axle there. I replaced that with these two thin wires and foam pieces that float. And it still didn't work. And so I tilted the two pieces in like this, where I had gravity helping to pull the floats down and things, and then it worked. So I have a patent on that. My patent says you make a stir with two pieces of wire that come in at a certain angle, like that. Okay. So you think about something like this, uh, that's pretty simple, pretty simple. They've sold over a quarter million of these. Okay. I wish I got a cut <laughs> of what they sold. Okay, but I don't. Okay. But so there are these things that you can do. Now, because of that, we end up with a patent on it. Whenever you have a product, it's great to have a patent. There's a lot of misunderstanding about patents, though. A patent does not give you the right to make something, it denies the right to make that to someone else. And Dr. Crowder will mention this too, I think. You can have a patent for an idea, but there may be another patent that keeps you from building the device that employs your patent. So there's a lot of things to go into it. There's also the fact that some patents, the only reason you do them is to keep competitors out. I have, I don't know, 40-something patents. I know one of the patents is a door in the bottom of a heated bucket where you store the cord. And when we did that, they go, oh, you can't patent that because here's uh, another patent. And I said, yeah, but my patent goes, my uh, door goes uh, perpendicular to the axis of the hinges and their one goes parallel to it. And they go, oh, okay, and we got a patent for it. Okay. Worthless patent. But the only reason you do is to keep your competitor from doing the same thing. At the same time, on that, say, that doggy fountain thing, the guy that invented it, he wanted to get a patent. Prior art, could not get a patent. I looked it up. Couldn't get a patent. I'm like, he got a patent on it. You know how he got it? His patent says he builds this thing, and it has a flat surface on top. In other words, some lawyer, he paid some lawyer thousands of dollars for a worthless patent. Because if I want to get around this patent, all I got to do is put a little crown in the plate, and he can't sue me or can't stop me. So if you're doing patents, do some research and know what you're doing first. Because the lawyers are more than happy to take your money. And he probably paid, I would guess, five to eight thousand dollars for a patent. That means nothing. Okay. Dr. Crowder can tell you there's other times you may end up paying fifty thousand dollars or something for a patent in order to get something that's good. So you have patents that you want to get, but you have to be aware of what's involved. In fact, this guy here was pretty realistic. He called one day and wanted to know for his doggy fountain if we could advertise it, you know, on a NASCAR racer, something like that. Very unrealistic. So, let's say you get a patent, but now the question comes, is it manufacturable? Okay. In other words, I have this great idea, but can I make it? Maybe that you can make it when you're sitting in a lab but for production, you can't. Uh, one company I worked for for a while was called Warning Systems. And they had to do with the CSEP program, which was where the Army was stockpiling uh, chemical weapons. And they were going to start getting rid of them by incinerating them. Well, they put out a thing where they were going to put tone alert radios. If you lived by an arsenal, you'd get one of these tone alert radios 
kind of like a weather radio. And then if they ever had a problem, they could alert you to get in your car and get out of there, you know, before this chemical weapon drifts your way. So uh, this warning system company, they had talked to these guys that designed this tone alert radio. But I knew one of the guys running the company, and he asked me to look at it, and I look at it and go, oh, yeah, it works. You can't build it. Because the way they had this set up, you could make the little radio, but then it would take you three hours to tweak it in. And then two hours after that, you'd have to go back and tweak it in again. And it wasn't viable. So I got it redesigned, and they ended up uh, winning like three contracts worth like $9 million or something like that for this program. But this brings up something else. This is Chemical Stockpile Emergency Preparedness Program. Let's say you had one of these radios that you'd made. You put it in a home. Guy lives next to a army arsenal. They're incinerating BX or whatever they, it was, these uh, chemical weapons. And they release some accidentally in the atmosphere. They warn the population. And your radio doesn't go off someone gets killed. Okay. So now brings up the question of liability. Liability. Okay. And that's a big question. And that's something else you have to think about. <clears throat> One of the products that this company API made that I was involved in, they made heated stuff like uh, tank de-icers. It's an electrical heater you put into your your water tank for your animals, your cows and stuff in the winter, keeps the ice from freezing. Okay, it'll turn on and off. Okay. You run electricity into a tank of water. And so here was a the ice or I designed. You put in water and you get this call. Your deicer killed my horse. Okay. Actually while I was there I got a couple calls like that. Your deicer killed my cow because here's this heater running a tank of water, and if it shorts out or something, the horse comes up, sticks his nose in, and drops dead. Okay. Well, there's a question of liability, or it burns down my barn or something like that. Okay. By the way, these were all rounded, and what we found is that. Not a single time was our deicer at fault. What was at fault was the electricity coming from the barn or stable that was leaking, in one case, 100 volts to the ground wire. So it was because of a fault in the barn that the horse died. So we weren't at fault in any of these, actually. Okay. But still, you might get sued even if you aren't at fault. So there's these different issues that come into play. So you know, you say, oh, we can't have this. Well, actually, we did everything right. And when you design a product, there's these different things like UL, Underwriters Laboratory, where you get it. Uh, they have a, uh, uh, I forget what they call them, uh, standards. They have standards, and you have to meet their standards in order to produce your product. Now then, you can sell something without getting UL listed. But some stores, maybe uh, Menards or something like that, they'll say, we're not going to list it unless you get it UL approved. Okay, so we go and get something UL approved. There's others such as CSA, which is the Canadian Standards, and CE, which is Europe. <coughs> okay. But these Places, especially UL, can be a pain in the neck to work with. Because okay. one, one advantage I had in working with is because they have these scientists and people there, and they write these standards, and then you send the product, they test them, and they charge you a lot of money to do all this. But uh, I was lucky in that a lot of times I knew more about it than they did. So I'd send something to them. They come back. Oh, this, you know, has an eyebrow back. So oh, yes, it does. You know, stuff. 
And in fact, we came up with something, and this is one product I like. It's an extension cord. Okay, you're a farmer. You got a tank of water here. You're going to put a de-icer in. <clears throat> it's a uh, a hundred yards from your barn. How do you get electricity to it? Oh, I'll run an extension cord, right? You all said, no, you can't run these off extension cords. The farmer has to install an outlet next to the water tank for it. Okay. I grew up on a farm. That's not going to happen. Okay. They're not going to spend money and time running an outlet that they use for four months out of the year when they can lay an extension cord across the ground and run it just fine. Okay. So we approached you all and said, what if we design something that has a watertight connection? And they thought about it and they thought, oh, okay, you do that. We'll check it out. If it, it passes, we'll approve it. So I designed this extension cord it has up here on the front, it has a, this is actually a gasket, it has them give to it, rubber gasket. These are threads. They look like rips. And then this here comes out, you plug it together and you screw it together and it's watertight. Okay. And so, works great. So now you can run extension cord out to your tank, okay? Well, our competitor got mad, and then you all realized that when we do this, we're going to have an advantage over the competitor. Okay. And so they reneged and said, oh, we've decided we're not going to approve that. Okay. Now, this is already after put a lot of time and effort into this and money, so I threatened to sue them. I said, and I sent them a letter. I sent a letter to the lawyers that we are going to sue you. Well, guess what? They changed their mind real fast. So now you can buy that over at Menards also with these products. Okay. By the way, UL can be a pain to work with. There's other places like MET where you can get the same approval as you get from UL, and they're a whole lot easier to work with. Okay. So I got a chance to do some products. It's fun to do. You get to be creative. There's a lot more to it than you think because there's everything from what type of material is this going to work, can I manufacture it, can I make money off of it, and is there a market for it? You might have a great idea that nobody buys. But the best, the funnest thing I ever did was the first thing. And that was after grad school, I went to Amico, actually it was Standard Oil Research Center in Naperville at that time or Amico Research Center, was working there. Dr. Crowder came up and joined us. <coughs> and we started making something called a diode pump solid state laser. We called them micro lasers. Now, this was a time, this was before LEDs. There wasn't no, any such thing as an LED. A red laser was maybe this big. A green laser was this big or bigger, right, Chuck? And a blue laser was this big and that, and that big around. Okay. We made a green laser. Where did I put it? This big. Okay. So that's why we call them micro lasers. Dr. Crowder gave me this about a week or two ago. Okay. This is the product we made. Had a power supply set out here, but this replaced something that was that big. In fact, a neat thing I got to do was there was a company out in California, it was a little startup company, that was one of the first companies doing um, computer graphics. And so they would, for film. So they would do something on a computer, and then they'd write it to film. They'd take three lasers, a red, and a green, and a blue, and they had on a big optical table, these huge lasers and mirrors, and they would scan them across film, and they could write the image from the computer to the film. Okay. So I went out there, spent about a day and a half out there, <coughs> and 
and we took out a big green laser like that off their optical table, put this on, and they tried it, worked great. Uh, it's a neat little place, a little company no one ever heard of before called Pixar. And so I got to go out, spend a day and a half, there's the laser by the way, I spent a day and a half at Pixar. I wish I'd bought stock. I wouldn't be here right now if I had. Okay. So we got to do some neat things. So we had a green laser. But Dr. Crowder's going to talk about the green laser. Everyone thinks, oh, green laser, that's great. That was what we all, we're going to make this, we're going to do great. But there were problems that we ran. So I'm going to turn over now to Dr. Crowder. So you're fl you're willing to flip slides? Yeah. Go ahead, and I'm going to just stand up here in the middle. So I got my uh, prop here. Hopefully, I don't drop it on the floor, which is what I did the last time. So if you'd go ahead and flip it. So we started, as Philip said, or Dr. Chumley said, inside Amico, and. It was the greatest place ever to work. I remember one time we had all the senior management of Amico. It's a $35 billion a year company. And they came out to visit us. And Dick Leet was the vice chair of Amico. And he said, what's the worst thing that can happen to me if this goes bad? And we said, a blind man alone, Amico. And it was about the liability issue that Dr. Chumley was talking about. I remember once we got a call from this person. He said, hey. I'm looking at your laser through an infrared viewer and I can't see anything. I said, turn it off, you're gonna blind yourself. He had the wrong viewer, he couldn't see. He had a viewer that only worked out at 1064 and this was a 1300 nanometer laser and he was shining the thing right at his eyeball. So liability is something we thought about. But we wanted to make red, green, and blue lasers. So as Dr. Chumley said, we had this great design and I wanna show you what the idea was. If you'd go ahead and go through those slides, Philip. Um, the simplest, in its simplest form, the micro laser consists of neodymium YAG. Neodymium, you know, is a rare earth. Yttrium aluminum garnet. You can put about 1.2% uh, neodymium to replace the, you know, the yttrium, and you can make a laser out of it. And then, so we put a mirror on this, this piece. We put a mirror here, and we put a mirror here, or right there, actually, and you get the light out. And then we wanted to make it a little, that just gives you an infrared laser. You can't see it, it's at 1064 nanometer in the infrared. So the next thing we said we'd do, and there were, you gotta have a way to light this thing up. You gotta have a power source. So we used a laser diode from a company called Spectra Diode Labs, and I'll come back to them in a minute. And the trouble with that is the, your light source is fanning out like this, and you want it to neck down in the laser and be tiny, and so you got to focus it. So we got a thing called a gradient index lens. And these slides, you, you took out the part where I thanked you for making a lot of these slides. So Dr. Chumley put a lot of these slides together. And these things cost a buck fifty, and this was back in 1986. So I don't know what they cost now, but they're used in all the CD players. It's a little round cylindrical lens that focuses the light by using changing indices of refraction. And so we put that in to focus the light, and now if you'd go ahead with the next one. So we called them GRIN lenses. It really stands for gradient index, but everybody just called them GRINs. And now we got the light focused in the YAG where we need it, and we get a nice beam out of it, which is, the next, which is red, infrared, and it comes out, the laser. But that's not the color we want. We want green. So we gotta use this stuff, and it's embarrassing for me to stand in front of a bunch of people who know chemistry and say, potassium titanyl phosphate, hell, I don't know what it is, but I call it KTP. Put a piece of KTP in there, and it takes two infrared photons polarized at 90 degrees to each other, and it turns it into one green photon at 532. So it's called a doubler. And so now you've got a green light beam, and everything's ready to go, and you're ready to go with your micro laser. And that, as Dr. Chumley said, that's what they look like. This one had a small fan. As we got higher and higher power, one of the other things you have to think about if you're designing a product, and you all know I hate thermal, right? I mean, I despise the subject. I try to avoid it whenever possible. But it's one of the most useful things there is to know if you're gonna build something. You've got to get the heat out. 
And so we did that. We put this little tiny fan on here and, and made it work, and you know, that improved things. But there was one issue, and go ahead to the next one, Philip, which was the thing didn't work. We could not consistently get this to work. And go ahead, Philip. We, we spent hour after hour after hour doing this, and we couldn't make it work. So I went to my boss one day, I was frustrated, because we'd spent years and millions of dollars trying to make this work. I'm not talking, you know, $500, I'm talking $5 million. And we can't get this thing to work. And I went to my boss and I said, you know what? We can't make a green laser to save our lives, but we can make one of the finest infrared lasers you've ever seen. What do you say we start trying to sell infrared lasers? He was so pissed at me. He, and Dr. Chumley, can, he said, you've lost the dream. I said, yeah, but we can build it. You know, Dr. Chumley's issue, is it manufacturable? And, I, and there was a customer named John Isles at Orchard Communications, and he said, you know what, we need a laser just like that for telecommunications. We need that to make a transmitter. And so we took it to John Isles and we started using our lasers and transmitters and all of a sudden that became our main application, our main focus. And then the amazing thing was, I, to this day this bothers me, it was everybody's idea <laughs> after it was successful. So we switched off from making lasers and that's my first point. A lot of times when you start a business, and I have never had more fun than when we started that business. There were about, I don't know, a dozen of us, maybe 15. We worked our rumps off. We had a blast. Dr. Chumley and I put together the first product manual for Amico. It was awesome. Way too, way too, not, cost 30 bucks a manual, you know? But we're selling it for, these lasers cost 10 grand in those days. Now you think of your little laser pointer. Now your laser pointers are the worst beams on the planet. You know, you don't want to do anything important with those things. But anyway, I was told that we'd lost the dream, but it turned out to be our salvation. We morphed from a, a, la I mean, a laser company inside a big oil company to a telecommunications company. In 1996, Amoco sold us to Scientific Atlanta for about $27 million. They'd spent 35 on us, but they got 27 of it back. And now if you go ahead to the next one, well, we started producing these things, but along the way we had some issues. And this is two that I want to bring up. We had a Japanese-American, very distinguished PhD, who'd worked at Argonne for years, but he was born in Japan. His name was Paul Shimotake. He was almost revered in Japan, a brilliant man. He came to me one day and he said, Chuck, I think we got a big problem. I said, what's that? He said, I've been looking at this stuff in the Japanese newspapers, and there's a terrorist operation, organization operating inside Japan, and I think they just bought one of our lasers through a, through a shell company. I said, oh crap. So what do I do? Well, I said, I'm gonna call the FBI. You know, this is one of those things where I don't mess around. I call the FBI, I bring them in. I got two agents sitting across the table from me, and they said, what's going on? What, could they use your laser to make this? We said, no, but they could use it to detect a gas leak. So, so we thought they were, and it turned out these guys were producing sarin gas. They were gonna put it in all the subways in Japan. They were gonna kill lots of people. You could use our laser to detect gas leaks. So we didn't get in trouble. We told the truth, the FBI tracked it down. Ultimately, these guys got caught before they did anything wrong. About two years later, we have a Chinese distributor. He gets caught at the biggest trade show in the US. Uh, optical fiber conference, or for laser people, it's the biggest one. And he's charged with exporting illegal fiber gyro technology that's supposed to be in the US. But he's working for us, he's not, he, he didn't steal our fiber gyro technology, he stole other people's stuff, but he's our distributor. Once again, I'm across this, the hall, or across the uh, table from two FBI people. Turns out to be the same too. The guy says, Chuck, I hope we stop meeting like this. You're a pretty nice guy, but you know. So they nailed him, we moved on. But So what's the lesson I learned? I think if you tell the truth, I, I don't see this much these days, 
But if you tell the truth and come clean, especially with something like that, we got no penalties whatsoever. The FBI was glad to know it. I think the information on the Am Toko Ri or whatever, AUM they were called in Japan, actually helped uh, catch the people. So we came clean and, and we were fine. Let's go to the next one. Um, so we tried a couple of acquisitions, and these things are two things I'm really bitter about. The, our management team, we wanted to buy the people that made that laser diode, that little light source. And that light source cost us a thousand bucks a pop. So we were paying a thousand dollars for one of those things. And we put together an acquisition package where we could buy that company called Spectre Diode Labs for $60 million. And Amico, $60 million for Amico is not much money. So we had them, we had the money sitting in Amico's treasury ready to go, the deal was ready. My boss's boss got cold feet and backed out of it. Three years later, Spectre Diode Labs sold to JDS Uniphase for anybody want to guess how much? Ten times the amount, you're low. Oh my goodness. $23 billion. We could have bought them for 60, they sold for 23 billion. Synchronous made transmitters and we wanted to buy synchronous. They cost five million. Once again, my boss's boss took a pass. I'm not going to give you his name to protect the guilty. Um, he said, nope, not going to do it. About six years later, I was running our company, and I said, we really need to buy their transmitters, and I wanted to buy Synchronous, and I was bidding against Motorola, or we were bidding against Motorola. We bid $280 million and lost to Motorola, who paid three fifteen. So this is just some of the things that go on. Everything is not smooth sailing is the point I'm trying to make. Things go up, come along and go differently than you expected them to. Let's go to the next one. You, soap matters. This was the worst period of my life. Um, we use something called Freon TF to degrease our parts. We made parts with a machine, in a machine shop. And we cleaned the oil off with this Freon-based compound. And the EPA came out and said, you've got to stop using Freon. And they told us way ahead of time, like a year ahead of time. So we said, we'll switch over to aqueous-based, water-based compounds. And we spent six months working with a, a company to switch all our products. We did so. About three months later, we start getting phone calls from all over the world. Now, when one of our products failed, we'd now made fiber amplifiers and things that are used in cable TV and things used for telecommunications. When they fail, 10,000 people all of a sudden are not watching the Super Bowl on Sunday afternoon. If one of them fails, 10,000 people go down as customers. And they're failing everywhere. I go, oh my God, I had to send people to China. We had a team in China, we had a team in Italy, we had a team in Germany. And I go to the eastern region, the northeast region of Comcast. And it's outside Valley Forge, which was kind of fitting, because I felt like I could have been at Valley Forge way back when. And I go up and tell these people, our lasers are failing. And the reason they were failing was you saw those components that were in the laser. The grease that was missed is this tiny residual grease was coating our optical components and that it would get baked on by the laser beam. And as it got baked on, the power of the laser would drop and the output power of our device would drop, just gradually. The good news was it was gradual. So I said, we'll keep you running. They stomped out of the room. Nobody certainly shook my hand except for one guy. Had one guy there named Wayne Hall. And Wayne Hall was a Marine fighter pilot. He said, fighter pilot the fighter pilot, which is the highest oath there is for us, can you fix it? I said, we got a great design, and I'm going to tell you about that in a minute, and we can make this work. I said, what we've got is a brand new design that gets rid of the laser that we've been building and allows us to just do this very special fiber that we've been working on. And this is the first one, I broke this last year, but this is the very first one we bought. We bought a company in Southampton in the UK 
to make this fiber, but who knew that just changing the soap would get you in trouble? So here's what we're trying to make quick and dirty. These were amplifiers that existed. People would pump, use a laser at 980 nanometers, which is in the infrared. They'd put a spool of fiber with erbium in it, gain fiber, read that as glass with erbium inside. And then a WDM is a wavelength division multiplexer. It's a way to put light together. But you could bring light out and you could make it a lot brighter than it was. So basically, we're using lasers to amplify your voice, and we can send signals through an optical fiber for about 100 miles using this technology, which is what's used today. So this is what we needed to do. But if you wanted to do this, you had, and by the way, a factor of 3 dB is a fa factor of 2 in power. So this is 18 to 22. And so these things were called erbium amplifiers erbium dope fiber amplifiers. We just called them EDFAs for short. And it cost a ton of money per milliwatt. And we had been using our lasers to pump something similar to this. So go ahead, Philip, and show you the next. And so we said, can we come up with a brand new fiber where we don't have to do this? Can we put a fiber inside a fiber inside a fiber and this is the inside thing. This thing's got erbium and ytterbium in it, but two things, two rare earths. We love those transition elements. We don't care about carbon. That's supposed to make you laugh, Kelleher. Uh, but we, we love the rare earths. So we built this fiber, had erbium and ytterbium in here, just straight glass here, and then we put an outer layer with fluorine in because we wanted these things to internally reflect, have total internal reflection. So that's what we built. And that was the plan. And go ahead, we'll skip through these fairly quickly. So what we wanted to do was build one where you could take 1550 nanometers in and have a big honking laser diet instead of what they called a single stripe. Instead of having one thing putting out light, you had a whole bunch in the same thing. So we, that was our goal. And go ahead, but look at the dB, go back one. 22 to 35 dBm, at least a factor of 10. So we got a device that's 10 times as bright now as it ever was before. And what's more, it gets rid of all these components that have had the, the gas outgassing on it. They're all going to be gone from the new device. This is what the fiber was intended to look like. It had an eight-lobe daisy around the outside. And then in the inside, this thing was made. Now, how did you make it? We got a big piece of glass, well, big, about the size of a golf ball and about this long. We'd hollow out these holes. And go ahead, Philip, let's go forward. This is what we're trying to, you got to make sure the light bounces off the walls. So we thought about all that stuff. And we did. And we had a huge advantage because this, those of you who are good at absorption spectroscopy, this is what the erbium peak looks like, and see how narrow it is and how shallow? You mix that with some ytterbium, and all of a sudden, you got a peak that you can't miss. You just throw in a dart at the wall, and you can hit this baby. So it made it really easy to pump, really cheap to pump, and it gave us a tremendous advantage in the marketplace. So we'd been working on this, but when I had people all over the world with lasers failing, we sure gave it a lot of priority. This is how you actually make the thing. It's unbelievable. We had a guy named Doug Anton, who's just about as smart as they come, who helped us figure this out. Excuse me. So this piece is in the center. You got a piece of glass, you drill these holes in it. You put this special piece in the middle, and then around the outside, you put smaller rods of glass, but then when you heat this thing up in a drawing tower, it melts together, and surface tension gives you this. And the reason that these, we want these knobs there, it's like hitting a pool ball. If you don't hit a pool, if you hit a pool ball off the corner, it'll just go around in a pattern like this forever. We needed all the light to go through the center of the laser. So that's what this accomplished. So if you go to the next slide, this is what we were trying to make. This is the first one we made. Not quite symmetrical. Got a little deeper here than we are on this side, but that's because we had this made in a student shop in Southampton in the UK. We switched to making it. We had a really great machinist in, in Chicago, and they made it for us. 
and we really nailed it. So all of a sudden, we had a device that worked. Wayne Hall came out and checked it out. And the good news was Comcast was so mad at me, right, they walked out without shaking hands. But after this, they loved us. Every year, they would have me go spend two days with each of the top ma managers at Comcast to tell them what was going on. You don't get an hour of a top executive's time at Comcast per year, but I got two days with each of them, and I could tell them what was going on, but it was because we had kept them running even when things were terrible. You know, when things were at their worst, we, we came through for them, and they, and they liked that. They appreciated that, so it had a happy ending. Let's go to the next one, Philip. That's what it looks like. We minted money in Naperville. We sold these boxes. Each of these individuals, this thing's 19 inches wide. Fits in a 19-inch rack mount. It's about 13 inches deep. Uh, each one of these modules sells for 20K, 19K if you want to cut it. We've sold four point, we sold $4.3 billion worth of this stuff. The last thing I did at Amico, or at Sign of Atlanta, I'm sorry, was to win a big Verizon contract. When Verizon tells you they got a great network, they do. We built it. <laughs> you know, so I, I have a lot of faith. And they had some really good engineers. So that's what it looks like. It's got provisioning. It's got computer interfaces. It's got all kinds of things that you would want. Let's go to the next one. Dr. Chumley talked about patents. We had several, we came up against that several times. To start the company, we had a major rival. And they had a strong patent portfolio. So we licensed a patent portfolio from Lytton. They had the right to all the Stanford patents. And Stanford's great in this area. So we licensed all of their patents. And it basically, we had what used to be called mutually, what was that, MAD? What's MAD stand for? Mutual assured destruction. Mutually assured destruction. That was the doctrine between the US and the Russians. We can blow you up, you can blow us up, let's leave each other alone. And that's what we did with Spectre, Spectre Physics. They had patents, we had patents, let's leave each other alone. Other issues, came, when we got really successful, when we started selling billions of dollars worth of stuff, we started to get sued. And the first big suit was from British Telecom. And they sued us for a billion two. That's a lot of money. <laughs> And so British Telecom came to us and said, we got a patent th that directly affects your transmitter and you won't be able to make your device anymore. And Dr. Chumley is right. Having a patent does not give you the, the right to build. I mean, you can't necessarily build it, but it keeps other people from building it. So they said, you can't build your transmitter. You're going to have to give us a billion two. So I sent the Doug Anthon I mentioned before down to the University of Chicago Library. And I said, Doug, come back with something. And Doug spoke Russian. I said, don't come back till you do. So Doug comes back to me, and he doesn't smile very often. But he came back and he said, I got him. And, and we sat down with the BT lawyers, and I said, you, here's, the, here's the prior art. It reads directly on your patent. And Dr. Chumley talked about prior art. That d invalidates a patent. It had been published in the Russian literature two years ahead of time, invalidated their patent and we sent them packing. Another time we got sued by Corning. Now at that time I knew we were in the final steps of negotiation to sell our company to Cisco. Cisco is Corning's biggest, uh, they sell more to Cisco than anybody else. They're their biggest customer is what I was trying to say. So I told those guys, I said, why don't you go pound sand because that's what you do best and turn it into glass and they, and they left us alone. I, I knew they would, you know, they weren't going to sue their biggest customer. But again, being in this position to start a company, to do something exciting, we had a great time. It's not without peril, but we had some great times. We were at a, a place with one of our suppliers in downtown, what, Baltimore? And, and we're having the time of our lives. I said it was this guy's birthday, it wasn't, but what the hell. We got three cakes, we had a blast. But we had great relationships, we had great time, but, but I wanted you to know there's frustrating things that happened as well and frustrating times also. So I think that's it for me. Um, any questions for Dr. Chumley or myself?
So this is the least technical but the most entertaining talk you'll hear all year. Right. All right, I want to say two, two quick things. Dr. Crowder mentioned when we were going to build green lasers, that was green lasers. Oh, we can make green lasers. In fact, a uh, guy, uh, Dick Grio from Melis Grio, saw our green laser and he went back and said, we need to sell the company because we were going to put them out of business. So we couldn't make a stable green laser. So Dr. Crowder went to our boss and said, hey, we need to be making higher lasers. Boss said he's lost the dream. The dream. He caught hell for it. <laughs> but because of what he did, we switched to our lasers and that's what saved the company. So here's, you know, he didn't give himself much credit. It hadn't been for him saying, no, this is what we're going to do. We'd have been out of business through all and the only well, there wasn't thing, a lot of choice. Yeah. <laughs> the only other thing is what he didn't tell you was about when we went to Baltimore, Clio conference, uh, about in the middle of the night, him taking one of our green lasers, and he saw a drunk walking down the street, and he shined it on the ground around the drunk. This is before laser point. That guy, I bet he stopped drinking after that. <laughs> I also, and don't, I won't repeat this, but I also lit up the, the, the green light when I shouldn't have. You know, I shone it on the traffic light. The traffic light. Nobody, it was 2 o'clock in the morning, so nobody was driving. But that was a stupid thing to do. Mark, you had a question? No, because once you publish something in the open literature, you have basically, what is it, a year to patent it yourself? If, if somebody does, if somebody like at the university puts out an idea, then it becomes unpatentable. You put it out to the world at large, it becomes what's known as prior art, and nobody can patent it. And so we were, because, and that invalidated their patent, is to answer your question. So yeah, patents are only good so long as you can't shoot them down with prior art. And thank God. <laughs> I hate to think what would have happened if we couldn't have shot it down. I'm glad, I'm glad Doug spoke Russian is the main thing. Any other questions? Yeah, Dr. Kelleher. So I'm going to ask a technical question. Oh God, well I don't know the answer then. So, I saw you had alumina in there. The it, alumina, is it alumina film? Is it alumina rod? Um, you, which, which, what are you like, talking like, about? The laser design, right? So there was a piece where you had it with the yagas and then you had alumina. alumina. Yeah, we, the, the only... A, I guess I'm just curious, because that is a, a semiconductor material. Is that the insulating piece of that? Or is that the cladding? The, in, the, in the cladding pump, we ultimately ended up, that was kind of an early design, Dr. K. We ended up just putting uh, glass with fluoride, fluoride in it. You, you could tell me there's only two elements that lower the index of glass and fluoride, fluorine's one of them. I don't know what the other one is. So, so each index had to be higher than the one outside. So we got erbium and, and uh, ytterbium in here. That makes its index real high. Then we had regular glass. And then we, dope, we ended up doping with fluorine in that outer layer. So was it like just a slug of material, I guess? It, it, it is. So the way it works is you get this big drawing tower and you got this piece of glass and to hold all those individual pieces together you build something that looks like flying buttresses at Notre Dame Cathedral. So you've got a centerpiece and then all these little rods are held into it by a piece of glass and you run it and, and then the outer sleeve was just a cylinder and you run that through this draw tower which melts it and, and it ends up being about this diameter of your hair and you've got a wheel down below it's a 10 meter high tower and down below you got a capstan wheel and you're measuring the thickness and if it's getting too thick you speed it up and if it's going if it's getting too thin then you slow it down and so you get this nice feedback and fiber you can get a spool of this fiber 30 kilometers long it fits on something about this big around. I mean, it's really, really small. And we coated that, Dr. Kelleher, with an acrylic coating, which would be great. You guys could, could knock the ball out of the park. As it went through the machine, it just got coated in, as an additional layer of protection on the outside. But the rest of it's just melted together, and it would literally, golf ball size, call it the size of your drink. That's close enough, but, but yeah. 
Anyone else? Well, thank you guys for your patience.